Hey, listeners of the Mental Health Warriors podcast, you're going to love this week's episode. I sure did. I think why I loved it so much is because I love talking about male stereotypes and the the roles men feel like they're supposed to take on in society, because while they obviously serve a purpose, um, they can really hamstring men when it comes to forming those deep emotional bonds that eliminate isolation and are very healing, but they're also just super important for living the full human experience. And this week's guest, Mark Green, uh, that's his wheelhouse, is really talking about this stuff. And it's a great conversation. I actually stumbled across Mark because I'm trying to remember back how I came across him. I think my wife, actually amazing wife, sent me a uh, an article he had written called The Lack of Gentle Platonic Touch in Men's Lives is a Killer. Now think about that, right? Even that title is is interesting because that's those are not words that men typically associate with being a man. Gentle platonic touch. So I was obviously intrigued when I read it. And then when I read the article, it is super, super powerful. And I will obviously link to it in the show notes page. And I suggest you read it too, because it will give you some new insight into what men are struggling with and what sort of society has placed on men and how it is holding them back, I guess. And, you know, we have some responsibility as men too. I mean, we're buying into this role. I think more and more men over time are starting to, you know, throw this yoke aside and start living the lives and and being the people that they were meant to be. But it's an, it's an uphill battle. And the, we're just at the beginning phases of this journey. And I want to celebrate Mark because he is uh, kind of the tip of the spear when it comes to this stuff. So let me tell you a little bit about Mark. He's an author, he's a speaker, and he's a dad. Hey, that sounds familiar. He's the founder of Remaking Manhood. Mark's articles on the suppression of boys' emotional expression – Parenting, men's issues, and relationships have been shared over 250,000 times on Facebook and other social media, resulting in 20 million plus page views. Man, that's pretty badass. That's my uh, color commentary there. He's written and spoken about men's issues at the Good Men Project, Salon, Shriver Report, Huffington Post, HLN, and the New York Times. Articles, videos, and reading lists on growing our relation intelligence are available at remakingmanhood.com, and we'll link to Mark's social media profiles in the show notes page. So thank you to Mark for coming on the Mental Health Warriors podcast, and thank you to Mark for also changing the conversation about what it means to be a man and how men can be fully self-expressed and live their best lives. It's an important topic and it is so directly connected to men's mental and emotional health and well-being. And that's why we're going to continue to talk about it on the Mental Health Warriors podcast. I actually got some uh, some other guests who have talked about this same subject from a different perspective that are in the pipeline and getting ready to be released for your listening enjoyment and your benefit and your knowledge. So thanks, Mark, and enjoy this episode of the Mental Health Warriors podcast. I'm constantly racking my brain thinking, okay, how do I add more value to people above and beyond the already awesome conversations that we're having in the Mental Health Warriors podcast? And that's why I've launched a Patreon page. Patreon is p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com and slash mental health warriors, patreon.com slash mental health warriors. So what is Patreon? Patreon is this amazing platform where people can make a direct contribution to those that are creating content that they love. And I know you love the Mental Health Warriors podcast because you're listening to it and you're spreading the word. But I also know that you support the Mental Health Warriors mission which is to assemble the most diverse and complete set of perspectives on emotional and mental healing and well-being anywhere on the internet, period. And I will not stop until we accomplish that goal together. But starting and, and running a movement or building a movement and running a podcast is not free and it's not cheap. There are all kinds of costs, graphic design costs, there's web hosting costs and web development costs and podcast editing costs and podcast hosting costs and calendaring, like scheduling costs. And it all adds up, right? And I need the Mental Health Warriors movement to not only be self-sustaining, but I need to grow it because the amount of people that we can help is just almost limitless. And I've seen how many lives we've touched already. 
Okay, but I'm not asking you to make a donation. I am telling you that I am offering you a value exchange. And what that means is in support or in return for your financial contribution to the Mental Health Warriors podcast and movement, I will offer you rewards that are super, super valuable and super impactful in your life. Okay, like you will be shocked at what I offer you in exchange for your financial contribution. So please head on over to patreon.com slash mental health warriors, support the show and let me make a contribution back to you in return for your contribution to supporting the movement. It's such a beautiful, virtuous cycle and I would love for you to be part of it. And I just, I can't thank you enough for your continued support of what we're trying to do here because every single person listening to this show has someone in their life that can benefit from what we are doing at Mental Health Warriors, and I want to be able to reach them. And if you want to also support the show, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a, a review and uh, a rating because that helps us get uh, surface higher in the search results. It helps more people reach our podcast. It literally takes you two minutes to do that, and it will help us spread our message. Thank you so much for your support. Thank you for listening and thanking you, thank you for helping me make a difference in people's lives. If you're a high performer who craves deeper human connection and you want to develop powerful relationships to help you achieve personal and professional excellence and you're sick and tired of feeling isolated and alone, then my new coaching program, Serving Powerfully, is for you. I will show you how to become more open and more powerful so you can create those human connections that allow you to see, execute on, and realize an entirely different caliber of opportunities. You will walk out of our time together with a vastly increased ability to serve other people more powerfully. It's amazing how far you can go when someone believes in you. So if this sounds like you, please let's set up a time to have a powerful conversation. Email me at jason at servingpowerfully.com and let's get started. Warriors are not born. Warriors are forged in the crucible of adversity. Warriors without fear are warriors without courage. We are men destroying stigma and stereotypes. We are a band of brothers because in brotherhood there is strength. Our weapons are strength, empathy, and honesty. We are Mental Health Warriors and this is our voice. All right, Mark, welcome to the Mental Health Warriors podcast. It's great to have you. It's good to be here. Yeah, so I we connected because I, I forget who, I think it was my wife actually sent me an article you had written about how important, you know, gentle platonic physical touches for men and how there's been all these, you know, issues around it, societal expectations or, or myths or misconceptions, and it's really causing us to feel isolated from one another. So I really want to get into that. But I guess first, why don't you tell me and tell the audience more about um, what Remaking Manhood is all about? Well, I, you know, one of the things I uh, talk about a lot these days, and the the article you're referring to was written, I think, about five years ago, and it continues to be an extremely popular article. And uh, it was put up on a site in Australia recently and, and you know, racked up 200,000 social media shares. Wow. I, I have no idea how many page views that is. But, um, but the point is that there is a, a definite uh, feeling among men and women that, that men are, um, are suppressed in terms of their expression emotionally. And one side effect of that is, uh, is also the physical touch. Now, uh, of late, I've been uh, moving through a lot of different work and, and a lot of writing about the question of, the, of sort of the general suppression emotionally uh, of boys and men. And there's a lot of research out there and so on. But for the, about the last eight years, I've been writing primarily for the Good Men Project 
Um, I published a book called Remaking Manhood. And I want to be really clear with folks that when I say remaking manhood, I don't mean changing men. I mean remaking our definition of the word manhood, of the idea manhood, because I think the idea that's commonly understood to mean manhood is uh, traditional masculinity is very narrowing and very dangerous for men uh, in terms of their uh, their well-being. So uh, so having said that, um, you know, I'm happy to talk about both this question of physicality, but also um, the other aspects of uh, being raised uh, as, as a boy in America and the work by people like Niobe Way and Judy Chu that, that have done a lot of research about what happens to boys uh, as they begin to uh, enter uh, elementary school and so on. Yeah, no, I'm really looking forward to getting to getting into that. So, I mean, for my my experience, really, kind of mirrored that. Maybe not in the in the, quite the way you're describing. I mean, my dad grew up, you know, in the '50s and or late '40s, early '50s in the in rural Canada. You know, they were destitute, dirt poor, and the idea, you know, they had an abusive father who had returned from the World War II, and emotional development was not even a thing that was on his radar. They were trying to survive, right? So for him. The gift that he gave to me was to end the cycle of physical violence, mm. but but which was a huge gift, and it allowed me to become who I am today. But I I learned not really through anything that was spoken specifically, like men don't cry or anything like that. It was just more by example, I guess, that this was logic to me. Logic and uh, kind of connotes strength and decisiveness and, and action orientation and all of that kind of stuff. And, mm -hmm. and emotions just seem to me to be weakness. And I think it was because they, they seem to be the antithesis of logic because they were unpredictable and they were, you know, I didn't, I, maybe I didn't understand them. Maybe they were completely predictable. I just didn't understand them. So I tried very hard to shut that down and man, that came back to haunt me. You know, when, when life threw me some pretty devastating curveballs, uh, I didn't have the tools to, to understand what was happening to, happening to me on an emotional level. So I did what a lot of guys do and just started drinking. Right? Yeah, so, yeah. yeah, I understand that. You know, it's interesting you talk about breaking that cycle of uh, physical violence. My father is a bit older than yours. Uh, he was a World War II vet, and uh, his stepfather beat him black and blue. I mean, that was his life growing up in Depression-era uh, Richmond, Virginia. And he broke the cycle with us as well. He did not bring that on. And he brought a lot of emotional warmth as well. Um, but, um, but ultimately, he fell prey to uh, divorce and the kind of alienation that can force on fathers at that time. Uh, and, he, and he just basically stepped away from us uh, after the divorce for a number of years. So that was, that was not good, having a, an affectionate, warm father and then, boom, gone. Hmm. But um, it's interesting that you talk about this question of, uh, of emotions as, um, as something that we need when, uh, when a crisis occurs, right? That some, some awareness of, of our emotional sides. Um, Niobe Way and Judy Chu have been doing a lot of work on what boys are taught in terms of traditional masculinity. And one of the things they're taught is emotional stoicism, that is, uh, not to share or show emotions. But emotions <clears throat> are pretty much central and crucial to the process of forming friendships, uh, forming relationships, forming uh, connection. We, we don't connect through logic. We share ideas through logic, but we connect emotionally as human mm -hmm. beings. And when boys are taught to not show that they need relationships, to, uh, to, to not appear emotional, they, they lose their ability to share their authentic selves in that moment. And they don't get to go through the... And, and boys as young as four and five, research is showing that those messages are already coming to them. Um, so they're not allowed to do the trial and error work over a period of years to learn the nuanced way that relationships operate, to learn to connect, to learn to listen to others, to learn to hold difference, to do all the things that, that we need in order to form friendships. Friendships aren't about finding people who are identical to us. Friendships are about taking pleasure in the difference that people bring and their own authenticity as well. And then what happens later in life um, is men reach these crises that you're talking about and they don't have a network of connections. They may have a relationship with a spouse. 
they may have some kind of relationship with their kids, but they don't have a larger resiliency network. And it's that network of real friendships, authentic friendships, that are what we need when we when we face crises. Yeah, that's really interesting, especially the part about, you know, finding connection in the differences, because I think, and tell me if you agree, but my sense is like, we're all so busy trying to conform to what we think society expects us to be as men that we never find time to to explore those differences because we're connecting around these superficial the superficial sameness i guess you could say that really limits our ability to you know have our ideas uh, you know put our our ideas into the marketplace of ideas and get new opinions and meet new people and develop new insights and and all of these kind of things because we're just connecting around this i guess superficial sameness well that superficial sameness isn't just something we're choosing to connect around when we step outside those rules men are often policed boys and men are policed mm. and bullied because they're moving into zones that may not fit that that particular box that men are expected to stay in. And I'll tell you something else. Um, I, I think this superficial communication is uh, endemic to the problem of, no, of, of a lack of authentic long-term relationships. Men are notorious for, uh, for, you know, basically hanging out with the other parents at school or the guys at the gym or or at work. And these are what, what I've heard people call proximity relationships, right? Well, you're standing next to me, so I guess I'll talk to you. And then their kids move to a new school and those relationships disappear, or they change jobs and those relationships disappear. And it's because of this constant policing to stay in these surface uh, a- approved kinds of communication, which by the way, when you talk about, it, you talked about the difference between logic and emotion. Well, there's another frame for that, and that is that a lot of um, a lot of these emotional communication skills are framed as feminine. We 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 wrongly define them as being well. That's what girls and, and women do. But there's plenty of of solid studies now that show that that boys are born with the same level of emotional connection, the same capacities. But um, you know, it we we beat it out of them. We, we, we punish them and shame them and police them to the point where they stop using those skills. And, and these are very highly developed capacities. Kids as young as three, four years old are already reading the most nuanced social cues, the most nuanced communication from their parents, their siblings, the other boys and girls around them, their teachers, everyone. And the question we have to ask ourselves as a culture is, do we want our sons to use those amazing skills to figure out how to connect more in the world or how to hide in the world. Because if we're policing them all the time, they're using those skills to figure out what not to do. And one of the things they're taught not to do is don't do something that might appear feminine. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And it's funny, even if we do express emotions, like what I, one of the things I tell guys a lot is, you know how when you go out with your buddies and you get drunk and you like, at the end of the night, you're putting your arm around each other oh, and yeah. telling each other you love her. And then the next morning, it's kind of weird. And you don't really talk about it again. If you can do that shit when you're not drunk, mm-hmm. let me explain to you how much better your life is going to be. Yeah. You know, for in all for all of these reasons, right? It's It's... So there, I think in some specific context, it's okay, but it's, you know, very narrow and usually booze is involved. Right, right. Well, people, are, men are afraid of being called out. Um, you know, um, there's, a, there's a lot of folks in the world who, uh, who will police uh, other men's masculinity. And one of the biggest, wep- one of the biggest bludgeons they use is that's so gay. Yep. A- and, uh, you know... Th- there, that's that's not even about uh, being homosexual anymore. It's just policing your performance of gender, right? Mm-hmm. Hey, toughen up, man. Straighten up. Come on, fly right. Don't do that stuff. And uh, I don't know if you're aware of this, but um, but the 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 health and longevity implications of this stuff is massive. The um, and and again, I'm I'm just talking through stuff. There's reams of research on this, but for example. Um, when we talk about this isolating effect of hiding one's emotional expression, uh, men and women uh, in America are living in an epidemic of loneliness. The AARP, the American Association of Retired Persons, did a study in 2010, and what they came up with was that one in three Americans 
are, uh, are chronically lonely. That's one in three Americans age 45 plus, because that's the group they study in. But I bet the numbers uh, work lower as well. But that, that's, that's 44 million Americans who are chronically lonely. That means they have no one to talk to about important issues. And when you are chronically lonely, it has the same health impact as smoking two packs of cigarettes a day. It increases your likelihood of diabetes, heart disease, cancer. Cancer metastasizes faster in lonely people. So this is, this is not just, you know, uh, new age, uh, lovey-dovey, you know, come on, everybody hug. This is about the fundamental way in which human beings are designed to connect and thrive socially. And we live in a culture that is essentially uh, going against our nature, uh, going against, you know, Charles Darwin said that, uh, that one of the reasons we survived as a species was our social nature. And mm -hmm. now we've, we've formed a construction of masculinity that punishes us for needing that social connection. No, I totally agree. It's funny, in the Mental Health Warriors, we just did a uh, book club and the book we uh, read was tribe by sebastian younger and this was basically his premise was that he was looking at at soldiers in combat in afghanistan primarily but we always have this we always have this narrative that people soldiers come back and they have a hard time adjusting because it was such so intense and it was such an adrenaline rush over there that they come back and reintegrating into you know regular society is difficult his contention is that's not the reason at all it's because that they felt such a powerful human connection mm -hmm. with their buddies with their platoons they literally mm -hmm. depended on each other for life and death and and they felt needed and you know so you, that mm -hmm. connection was as deep and as powerful as it could be when they come home we don't, our society is designed to do exactly what you're saying we don't have that human connection with people and that's what they miss and that's what they have such a hard time adjusting to he talked about speaking of the the health implications he was talking about native american cultures and how Things like post-traumatic stress or mental illness are hardly even a thing there in those in those traditional cultures, right? Because because of the the sense of community and tribe and the way they treated each other and everybody depended on each other. So, I totally agree with you that there are and it's it it's funny to me that people still might think that it's somewhat new agey that our emotional health and our, our connection with our fellow human beings has you know definable health out health physical health implications of course it does but it some people still believe that that's new age nonsense yeah well also you know if you look at the way corporate america is going in terms of what skill sets they want uh managers and executives to have uh and they want people to have on their teams it is the ability to hold difference it's this relational capacity it's this um uh, this capacity to connect emotionally in the workplace, which allows for a much more creative, dynamic um, environment. And, and these are, I mean, we're literally talking about corporate uh, hiring policies that are, that are putting human resources programs in place to teach this stuff or to grow this stuff. So what they've come to understand is that the sort of old school uh, leadership models were actually suppressing productivity and creativity in the workplace. And so if you want your sons and daughters to have successful careers, this issue of uh, growing their emotional capacities, their relational intelligence is crucial to their success, especially in the future. Um, these, these are all simple, uh, logical conclusions. If you have ever met someone who has this set of skills, these capacities, this relational stuff. Because one of the things you find out is you're drawn to them, they're interesting, you feel connected in the moment that you meet them, and all of this power comes out of the simple fact that they are open to others, right? It, and this is the difference between having a life where you feel like you're not connected enough to people, that you're kind of lonely, that you're kind of looking around, you may be self-medicating, you may be throwing yourself into work, you may be doing all these things to fill that kind of hole in you. When in fact, it's just human connection that you're looking for. Any of us are. And it's interesting, you know, we, we talked a little bit before we began uh, here today um, about the idea that, that it's easy enough to name the problems, but what are we doing to come up with solutions, right? Um, my wife is a, uh, is a couple and family therapist, and she is um, 
has been working for years on a number of uh, ideas and programs and processes to help kids and adults um, develop what's called a, their relational capacities. And she has this idea about relationships that, that most of the couple and family therapists, which is a school of psychiatry, uh, there's about 50,000 of them practicing in the U.S., but they believe in this relational space, which exists between people. So when people are in a relationship with each other, whether it's your wife, your friend, your coworker, there's the, there's the me, and there's the you, and then there's the us. And the focus is taken off of me and you and put on the us. What are we creating together? What is this thing called our relationship, and how does it operate? So when I make a choice about whether I'm going to say something or not say something or challenge an idea or make a contribution, I run it through a quick filter. I know what it'll do for me. I get to say what I think. I think I may know what it will do for them, but what does it do for the relationship? And once I check in with that relationship, it may change the way I choose to say it. It may change, change the order of what I say first. Hey, I think this is a really great project. I think a lot of things about this are pretty awesome. Um, I want to bring up something that I think we may want to think about versus if you've ever been in a meeting and someone you've shown them, a you know, five weeks of work and they just ignore the part that's working and they go right to the problem and they point at it. Mm -hmm. So this is the difference between being relational in your approach to others and being me oriented, right? Oh, absolutely. You know, when I was listening to you talk there, it reminded me of a moment I had when you talk about how being authentic, you know, helps people create a connection with you. And so I had started talking about some of my story and being open about it. Uh, my wife took her own life and I, I dealt with that through drinking. And as I was saying earlier, so as, as I started to heal from that, I stopped drinking. I really started to think, man, I got a story I need to tell here. And I started to tell it. Mm -hmm. And I was starting to understand the power of being vulnerable and, and just being open and, and turning my, what I thought was my greatest source of shame into really my greatest contribution in the world. And anyways, so I'm sitting there, it was in 2015 and I was talking to a guy, we had just gone out for coffee and it was the first time we'd hung out together. And I was absolutely drawn to this guy. It was so powerful. And I, I remember saying to him, you're going to, you may think this sounds weird, but man, I, I feel like completely drawn to you right now. Like, I don't know what it is and I want to understand why that is. So I started, we talked about it a lot and yeah, I came, it just, we ended up coming to that conclusion, right? That, Hey, we're both just here being authentic. And those conversations are so rare or were so rare in my life at that time that I walked away from there and my head was spinning. And, uh, I started exploring the idea of vulnerability and authenticity. And I, I remember thinking to myself, like, how is it that nobody has ever told me this? how powerful this is about just being yourself and creating a safe place for somebody else to be themselves. So uh, what I, I got so fascinated with the idea, I ended up writing a book about it. It's called The Dadly Book of Open, How Cultivating Vulnerability Makes You a Stronger, Wiser, and More Courageous Father. Mm. Because um, I just... Uh, because that's what I guess what flabbergasted me it was here I am I was 40 41 or 42 years old at the time and it's like I discovered the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow and it was sitting there in front of me all along and all of all the adults that I had talked to my entire life it this somehow never came up How, mm. it just blew my mind yeah well if you think about um this idea that it, as early as age four boys begin to get get their emotional expression uh policed and suppressed you have to compare it to learning a language, right? When, when, when very young boys are, um, are expressing emotions, uh, even babies, they, these emotions come out as very harsh declarations. They're very erratic. They're, these are the first sort of attempts to communicate emotionally. And it's the same thing with language. Uh, when a baby first begins to speak, it's it's just little bursts of verbiage. It doesn't make much sense. It's, it can be very loud. It can be but if imagine if as soon as your child began to learn to speak, every time they did so, you made fun of them or, or punished them or shamed them for how they were doing it or the fact that they were even trying to do it, how quickly would that child stop trying to talk? Pretty quickly. Right. And it's the same thing with emotional expression. We put boys through this, this grueling course of policing until they cease to mess with emotions. They don't want anything to do with it. Because they understand that it's a sign of weakness, as you said earlier. It's a sign of, um, 
of being a, a, a little kid or a girl or gay or whatever completely irrational uh, pol policing critique is applied to it. And ultimately, uh, later in life, you're, you're trying to connect with people and you're trying to understand what feels vibrant but you haven't you haven't had the 20 years of learning about this that to learn nuanced ways to communicate when we speak when we speak to each other ha, not only what words we use but what we choose to accent what words we choose to to bring our voice down on versus up on what words in what order and what those words mean contextually what a word means between two men or between two women or if I'm standing in India using words, they have a completely different context. They're a completely different set of meanings. We learn all this stuff. We're incredibly nuanced creatures. If we have time to do this emotionally, if our children have time to develop these capacities, they come into the world with a superpower, right? And even if someone comes at them with a very limited emotional vocabulary, they're able to engage better. They have, for example, the capacity not to collapse into someone else's emotions, right? Over time, you can learn this. When someone comes at you with anger, you don't meet them with anger. You wait a second and say, you know what? I'm, gonna, I'm not going to let them pick my emotion for me. I'm going to choose how I respond to this. And how they respond may diffuse the situation, may change something. Who knows? And to this day, believe me, I'm no superhero. I struggle with not popping out with that anger when someone comes at me with anger. But these are things, if you're mindful of it and you care enough to start teaching your children, they can grow these capacities over time. And then they're not as susceptible to, uh, to things like peer pressure. They're not as susceptible to shaming and all the other stuff that goes on out there because they see the bigger picture, right? And they see emotions as they operate socially. So it's an amazing set of skills. And when you meet a guy... And you say, look, this vulnerability thing matters to me. I, I went out to lunch with a friend of mine uh, about five days ago. And, and a couple of days before we went out, I said, look, man, I'm feeling kind of depressed. Can we talk about it? And he is a guy who's been writing about it for the Goodman Project for a while about depression. So I figured it was kind of in his wheelhouse. I mean, like he wouldn't be like, uh, uh, listen, I can't make lunch. But, um, but, but just, just telling him that, knowing that I was going to be able to talk to some of that a few days later – uh, was a big deal. It may, it lightened my load, even just knowing that conversation was coming. And then when we, when we got there, uh, my friend, Michael, who I've known for a number of years, our, our relationship changed in that conversation because I admitted some stuff that I was struggling with. He was able to hold that for me and, and reflect it back. We were able to talk through it. And suddenly my connection with him went much deeper. Mm -hmm. And now the fact that he's out in the world just makes me happier. You know, I know, I, I know he's got, he's got me covered and vice versa. And this is the nature of vulnerability. It is a, it is a, a, a conduit for connection, for real connection. Oh yeah, I totally agree. So how do you answer the question from maybe a previous generation when they, or how do you answer this comment when they say something like you sissies only have time to talk about this shit because we went to war, we defeated the Nazis, we saved the world, we came back, we built the industrial base of America, you know, we made, we put the infrastructure in place that made you wealthy enough and have enough free time to talk about this shit. Well, I, I, I'll say one thing about that. I think the idea that, uh, that learning to connect emotionally is not, is not a, a replacement for being tough. Um, I'm fairly confident that, uh, that there are plenty of emotionally connecting people out there who could kick your ass, right? <laughs> I mean, it's not a question of, oh, well, you have to give up this in order to become that. Um, but more importantly, uh, I, I've had a guy, um, I had a guy one time comment on one of my threads and he said, you know, uh, this stuff's all fine and good, but, um, but, oh, sorry about that. No, no worries. Um, but one of the, um, one of the things he said was, look, you know, you got to be tough in the world or you're going to get your ass kicked. You're going to be a victim. You can't go through life inviting, uh, to uh, inviting people to victimize you. And what I said to him is the same thing I said a little earlier here. We, when you are able to choose your emotional response, especially in a heightened or, uh, or even scary situation, 
when you've got enough self-awareness that you're not automatically coughing up an emotional response, that puts you in a more powerful position. And I don't care if that's in the boardroom or in a bar fight or anywhere else. Sure, you want to go ahead and throw that punch? Be my guest. But don't do it automatically. And don't let people yank reactions out of you because you're so easily triggered that, and you have no self-reflection and no ability to manage your own reactions in the world. To me, that's, that's a layer of additional strength. It's not about swapping one for another. Right. No, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, I define vulnerability as, as having the courage to look yourself in the mirror and be honest and without judgment about who you see staring back at you. And I always tell people that is self-acceptance is the greatest defense for what, whatever you perceive the dangers out there to be in the world, because that's something that's very common. Oh my God, if I start showing my emotions, basically people believe that they are surrounded by people that want to do them harm and will pray on the weakness that they are showing by, you know, being open about their emotions. But sure, sure. I always, I always tell people, and my belief anyways, is that self-acceptance is the greatest uh, defense against that. Because if you, if you love and accept yourself as imperfect and, you know, as a work in progress and is on a journey, man, there's, there's not really that many things people can say to you that would really hurt you at the level, at the same level as if they were, confirming, you know, judgments you were already holding about yourself. So, but aside from that, the other thing I found in my personal life and most of the people I talk to is we're not actually surrounded by people that want to hurt us. We're surrounded by people who are as desperate for human connection as we are. Mm -hmm. And they're just, somebody just needs to go first. And when you go first, it's friggin' amazing what happens. Yep. And also you have to understand that when you're in a crisis, uh, whether it's physical illness, divorce, uh, you know, a car wreck, whatever it is, your social network, which is created out of these emotional, authentic connections, is what will resource you. That's where your resiliency comes from. It doesn't come from, from sucking it up and being tough. It comes from the connections, the people who come in to offer help, support, all that stuff. We are social animals, and it used to be your village was the people that you could rely on. Now we've cut ourselves off from that and created this gated community, you know, car in the garage, don't go out on the porch world, and people are literally dying from it. They're dying from an epidemic of isolation in America. And the other thing it's creating is huge amounts of reactivity and rage and anger. It's driving a lot of our public discourses right now because people are not connecting. They don't know how to do it. And subsequently, it would be like if you took a dog and chained it to a doghouse in the back of a yard. Trust me, you walk up a year later and pet that dog after t doing nothing but taking some food out once in a while, that dog's going to bite you because that dog's going to be socially and, uh, and emotionally distorted by the isolation. Our children are the same way. You know, they need connection with us. They also need connection in the world. With, uh, any one of us, any man who thinks back to the vibrant, amazing friendships we had as young boys will feel a sense of nostalgia for that. Where did that go? Why did, that get, uh, why did that get eliminated? Niobe Way writes a book, uh, wrote a book called uh, Deep Secrets, and she's been doing interviews with, uh, with uh, boys in early and late adolescence for 15, 20 years. And what she discovered was, by, when these boys are first entering these, the uh, uh, adolescence, their friendships, they, they describe their friendships as, as be, that they love their best friend. They, it sounds like a harlequin romance, right? And the other thing they say, all of them say, no matter the class, culture, race, whatever it is, they say, without my best friend, I would go crazy. I would go nuts. Then you go forward three or four years to uh, later in adolescence, and these boys are all saying, well, you know, my best friend still lives around the corner, but I don't see him that much. And another boy described it as, well, that friendship sort of feels like it's on a crossfade, right? It's just fading out. And what we find out is that if they do say something nice about those guys, they follow it with no homo. Just to let you know that, they, that anything nice they say about another kid, they're not gay. The long and short of it is they have been taught to define themselves not by who they are, but by what they are not. They are not a little kid, they are not a girl, and they are not gay. So when boys start defining themselves by what they have been shamed about or shamed by, then they are, they are lost. They are lost. And, and, and they're told after that, well, you want to have, you want to have communication, go find a girlfriend. That's going to be your, that's going to be your emotional support. 
in the world. That's it right there. And these girls are in no position to take on this level of demand that these boys have once they've been cut off from all their male relationships. So it's a mess coming and going. And, uh, and these boys uh, grow into men who simply don't connect emotionally with other men. And it's the one thing we actually need. So do you think, you, you mentioned something about sort of, I don't remember exact words, but like the political climate in the United States, for example. Do you think part of that is because we are so desperate for connection that we're looking for connection anywhere we can find it around any any topic that feels like a connection? Is that part of it? Well, I'm, I would just go so far as to say that when you're isolated, you're angry. So we have angry okay. politics. We have, and this is not a right or left thing. Sure. Everyone's busy pointing fingers at each other and and naming each other as this ism or that ism or this ist or that ist. Um, whether you're whether you're angry about political correctness or racism, it doesn't matter. The, the fact that we look at at other human beings as them and us and those people over there are idiots. We're, we're talking about, we're talking about, we're, we're a nation now that's literally pointing at populations numbering in the millions and calling them idiots. Mm -hmm. How do you get to that place? You get to that place when you're lonely and angry. And it, you don't have to be on the left or the right to feel that isolation. We all feel it. So until we begin to take joy, genuine joy in the connections we have with other people, especially across difference, hey man, you know, I can look at everything about you I disagree with, or I can look at all the amazing things you are and have done in your life. Well, I get to choose which thread do I want to pull about a human being I just met, about a population of people I've never met. Which threads do I want to pull of their story? That's my choice. But when we choose to pull something that just validates our own anger and isolation, then that's, a, that's poisonous. That's a cancer both in ourselves and in our culture. No, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, one of the things that's the most gratifying about what I'm doing right now is that when you create a safe place for guys, you know, it would be nice if all of everywhere was a safe place for guys. And that's why I admire the work you're doing so much. But in our community, uh, mental health warriors community, or sometimes I facilitate mastermind groups, it doesn't matter. The point is that when guys come together in a place and they realize the moment they realize it is safe, it's unbelievable how fast the mask comes off. Because yeah, nobody, yeah. nobody wants to be wearing it. Every, I mean, I think fundamentally, we all want to be accepted for who we actually are in the world. So as soon as we realize that, wow, I'm around a group of people that might actually do just that, it's beautiful to watch that moment and to watch what happens as a result of that when they share some of their innermost secrets and get nothing but love and support and, and, and connection in return. It's just such an awesome thing to be a part of. Yep. You know, I, I, we were talking about solutions earlier. And we, you know, we talk about some ideas that seem to be pretty, um, pretty nuanced, this idea of not collapsing into the emotions of others and so on. But there's some baseline stuff you can, uh, I, you know, we worked with our son when he was little and, uh, and I'll, I'll give you an example of one of the things that, that happened with him and, and what we did to address it. Um, uh, when my son was, uh, uh, four, uh, I got divorced and, uh, and then I, I got remarried a couple of years later. And my wife, uh, Sally Ha and I, who I mentioned is a, is a therapist, and I would be having some sort of uh, debate or uh, heightened conversation. And my son would say, you know, you guys, please stop fighting. And he had good reason to not like fights. He had seen the result of them before, right? So, uh, so for him, you're either talking nice or you're in a fight. He's six years old, five and a half, and this is what the world looks like to him. So we said, oh, um, well, you know, Gus, maybe um, let, let's do this. Um, why, don't, why don't you tell me what you think you saw? Did you see uh, a conversation, a discussion, a debate, a disagreement, an argument, or a fight? And we wrote them up on a whiteboard, right? We put all these things up there. And he said, uh, uh, well, I don't know. And I said, okay, well, well I'll tell you what. We're going to we're gonna, we're gonna perform it again like theater, like we're at a theater, and you tell us what you think it is. And so Sally and I did a version of like what we wanted for dinner, right? And we picked a level of disagreement, and he looked at it, and he's like, oh, I don't know. I guess, I guess that's a, not really a fight. I guess, I guess that's a disagreement. And we said, yeah, yeah, now, now Gus, you do it. You, you do this thing. 
and you do it with Solly Hawk, and, and I'll try to guess what you guys are doing, right? And so he, he and she whispered to each other, and they did some version. And ultimately, what came out of this was he no longer saw things as either getting along or fighting. He saw them as different levels, right? Mm -hmm. And in that moment, it was no longer they're going to stay together or they're going to break up for him. That fear part of it went away. But he also started seeing levels of emotion. And that's just one example of the kind of stuff that we did with him. Um, another thing we did with him was uh, he and I got a big giant piece of paper back when he was four or five years old. And we drew big buttons on it. And we labeled the buttons. Uh, sleepy, happy, uh, you know, hug Gus, data, stop being grumpy, you know, various things. And, and he made this stuff up as we went, right? And then we hung it on the wall. And whenever we were going through our days, he could run over and smack one of the buttons, or I could, or Saliha could. And w the person that, that we're looking at had to perform that, that thing. They either had to give a hug, or they had to stop being grumpy, or they had to... And believe me, if you're having a bad day, and you're cranky, and you're gr griping about... And your, your little boy runs over and hits that button, you're going to think real hard about changing your mood, right? <laughs> yeah, and in the, moment, sure. in the moment that you do it, your child learns something very important, and that is that our moods do not control us. We can make choices. We can make choices about how we are behaving, and we can do things together that can shift our mood. And this is a very powerful lesson learned at a very young age. But, uh, but the buttons uh, were up on the wall for two years, I think, and everybody was running over, smacking them, and, and one of them was like bark like a dog and they, various things, you know. Uh, but it was a very helpful tool, and I think it it gave him the sense that that we're that that our moods or our emotions are not created inside of us; they are created in that relational space between us, and we have a responsibility to take care of that relational space, including what kind of messages we're pushing into it, right? What kind of emotional stuff we're doing. So, as far as parenting goes, then, and as your kids, depending, so how old is your son? He's now 12. Okay, that's perfect. My kids are 12 and 13. So how do you now at this age going, you know, an Im having an imminent teenager, I guess, how do you express your emotions to them or, or teach them in an age-appropriate way about the importance of that emotional connection and, and acknowledging and expressing our emotions? Um, oh, it's a disaster now. I've given up. <laughs> <laughs> no, I feel your pain. I, I, I feel I, your pain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's over, man. Forget it. It was I did what I could when he was young. Um, uh, seriously, I, I I think that um, I think that you just you just try to keep the conversations happening, and and sometimes that's my wife talking to him more than I am. Sometimes that's me resisting the urge to try and engage around an issue when he's reading that that's not really what he wants, because I think that. Um, I think that part of this process is knowing how to be with someone without necessarily needing to um, to drive your what you what you think the agenda is in that moment. And for me, being with kids his age, I mean, he's he's basically differentiating now. He's he's breaking that connection with us as his parents. And trying to find his own identity in the world. So a lot of his time and attention is being aimed at, at his peer group and whatever. But there are still times of the day when those conversations can happen. And uh, they tend to be when he's trying to keep from having to go to bed. Believe me, I'm, I'll leverage what I can in the world, right? Um, and, uh, and in the moments when those conversations can happen, they can be, um, they can be brief you can drop in and out during the day little bits of information about how you feel and how that how that work for you. Um, one of the big challenges I think parents face sometimes is the need to have the big conversation. But honestly, it's the it's dipping in and out the little it's uh, it's called seeding. You just drop an idea and you move on before there's time to resist it. You know, there's things that you can do just connection wise. Uh, touch, you know, just when. When he goes by, I put my hand on his shoulder. Um, there's all that kind of stuff that hopefully bridges around the chaos that is the teen years. 
Yeah, no, I love that. You know, one of the things that I do is I'm pretty open with my kids about about how I'm feeling about specific things. So, for example, when I was writing my book, I remember sitting down with my daughter who was working on a huge project at that time and and saying, you know, this this book is your your project is my book to me, right? And I know exactly what you're feeling and here's what I'm going through. And, you know, it, it really allowed us to create a connection over sort of a shared experience. And as I progressed through writing the book, I was able to tell her, okay, here's what here's what it's like. You know, now I can, I'm gaining more confidence. I believe I can finish it. I'm seeing light at the end of the tunnel. I'm learning more. And these are all the same thing that's going to happen to you. Um, and I think the other one that I do, and it's not, it hasn't been a much of an issue now. Thankfully, my kids are pretty good. But in the past, if they did something that, you know, was out of bounds, let's say, I would always tell them about how, what what they did, how it made me feel. And also how having to have the conversation made me feel. So I'm your dad. It's my responsibility to have this conversation with you. But I want you to know that there's a lot of, be- there's a lot of other things I'd rather be doing right now than having this conversation with you because it hurts. And it's, it, I'm, you know what I mean? So when I express that to them. I feel like that helped them get a, another layer of insight into the emotional aspect of the things that happen to be going on in our life. Yeah. Well, the, the data that you give kids, whether you choose to show a little bit of your process or not, um, I think more than anything else, normalizing conversations about emotions, normalizing conversations about, about conflict, uh, all of that stuff. I don't tell my kids don't have conflict. I tell my kids conflict is normal. It's mm-hmm. how you do it and what you do afterwards that really matters, right? That when I talk to my kid, I, I'm like, you know, this thing where uh, where you're really mad at me, I, I've been there. I know what that feels like, and that's fine. But how do we how do we express that, and how does that come out? And, and how does it make you feel when you're this mad at someone? Can you, can you forgive yourself for being that mad? You know, all of these things are parts of that conversation, right? And, uh, and I think it's different for every kid and every parent because these relational spaces are not uniform, right? <clears throat> Each one is fundamentally different from, from every other because it's made up of these extremely individual human beings, so what works for my kid and me isn't going to work for you, your kid and you. You guys have to design what works for you. And, and you do it. You do it every day. We're constantly designing and redesigning these relationships. But uh, with luck, the love that we have for each other will be the bridge that allows us to keep adjusting. Okay, well, oh, I look, this thing that worked last, last month isn't working anymore. I got to take a step back and look at it and try to figure it out. And, uh, and, and, but that's the process of being human. And for kids, it's a much more accelerated process, but it's going on between you and your spouse, you and your parents, everyone. And anybody who thinks that they've reached a stable relationship is missing a single crucial point, which is we're all changing all the time. And so instead of saying, oh God, I got to go back and do some work on my relationship, you can instead choose to go, wow, look at this new stuff. This is amazing. Wow. You know? Mm-hmm. And that's, that's simply the choice to, to, um, to enter. There, there's a thing that, that we talk about. My, my wife and I are actually working on a book called The Forever Book. And it's about these kinds of tools and ideas about how to connect relationally with, with our kids. Uh, God knows when it'll be done. I, I know, yeah, you know. <laughs> but, um, but the long and short of it is one of the great things um, that, that's coming out of, of, of writing that stuff is an awareness of how much we have to hold uncertainty, right? We have to, we, as parents, our job is to be certain, right? We're going to get the homework done. We're going to get the kids to school. We're going to get food. We're going to do this. We're going to make sure our kids don't get run over by a car. All this stuff that seems to have to do with predictability and certainty, when in fact we're, we're in this, this incredibly uncertain process. And our urge to jump in with answers and solutions and stuff, that's not so helpful, uh, sometimes, sometimes we need to actually, um, you know, make the choice to not to see what's emerging and be careful about that. So, um, oh, I think I lost you for a little while. Okay, um, here. the uh, and, and so in the process of of this uncertainty, we can learn to listen and actually hear things that maybe in our in our rush to fix stuff and and be certain about things we're ignoring entirely, right? 
And it's out of those spaces that new stuff emerges. And that's with our spouses, our coworkers, our kids, everybody. Um, it, it's really hard not to just, just, you know, lunge ahead with our agenda and our ideas uh, and instead listen. It's a difficult work. I'm terrible at it. I talk constantly. I never let anybody say anything, but you know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah, th that's really interesting. So the, I also, I guess with the uncertainty by not jumping in with and constantly trying to find solutions, I guess that creates a space for our kids. I mean, it creates a, oh, yeah. a, a, a massive space for our kids to grow and experience uncertainty themselves and, and solve problems and, and then be able to reach out to us maybe in a different way, right? Maybe for some advice or some guidance around a specific facet of this issue rather than just us barfing the solution all over them. Oh yeah. This, this thing where we, um, create us in that relational, that relational space is basically a combination of, uh, of two individuals ideas. Uh, and, and if you're driving a lot of ideas into that space, then the other person is more uh, receiving ideas and they're not really bringing their stuff as much. Imagine a series of arrows moving into a circle versus a few little tiny arrows on the other side. When you're with a four or five year old and you hold off on pushing so much data at them, they get to put a little more in and they're like, oh, I put an idea here and here's some more stuff. And suddenly they get used to that idea of bringing what they're, what they're seeing. It's only when we hold off from giving them an answer that they start coming up with their own. So, and, and this is the same thing again with adults and everybody else, you know, are we bringing answers or are we, are we bringing a willingness to listen? And, and maybe wait and see what emerges out of a conversation where we're not seeking answers, but instead we're just talking about possibilities. Well, I don't know. What did you think this meant? I don't know. Maybe it meant this. Well, that would be interesting. But if, if, but if it meant that, it, doesn't that go against what we were saying last year? Well, I don't know. You know, this, this mm -hmm. question of how do we have conversations that are not solution focused, but instead are just uh, we, we – and also when we're talking to a spouse – how do we get our mindset in a way where we expect to be surprised? We expect to hear something we didn't hear before. We're, we're, we're actually, cause that's the thread you start to pull when you have that expectation. But when it's like, oh yeah, I got a file, a full file on this person. I know what they're going to say. I know what they're going to do. I know everything about them. And in that moment you limit them to that, right? Yeah, definitely. It's funny. My wife, I'm laughing right now because my wife, she always, she's a real possibility thinker. <laughs> and sometimes I'm not. I'm no, usually okay, but I have my moments where I'm definitely not a possibility thinker. So sometimes All of I'll us come do. up. Yeah, so sometimes right. I'll, I'll say something limiting or whatever. She'll say, what else is possible? She always says that. And sometimes I'm like, oh, my God, please stop saying what else is possible. I know there's other possibilities <laughs> that I'm not saying. I'll just stop saying it, please. That's right. Oh. Today we're going to work on not saying that. Is that possible? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I right. know. I know. Well, we're, look, we're, we, are, we have to understand that as human beings, we are – uh, we are full. Well, a, we live in a world and a culture, which is so binary. It's really, Oh, you have an opinion. Well, let me figure out what my opposite opinion to that is and share it right now. Cause we live in a binary culture and that's how we're supposed to operate. But we are ultimately contradictory creatures. And we have a little of everything in us. And as much as we want to be open to possibility and what's emergent, there are days when I just don't want to hear it, right? Can we just solve this thing and move on? Because I can't take another insightful conversation right now. This is the basic contradiction of being human. And as soon as we accept that about ourselves, that we are, that we are full of dichotomies, full of contradictions, and learn to hold both sides of it, I am this and I am also this. We open up all this space to be like, you know what, I, I'm not going to get policed for everything I ever say, but you said X. Yeah, and today I'm saying Y. And let's talk about the difference between those two and why they both seem to make sense for me, right? We're so, we're so hard on ourselves. We're so, we have so much accountability. We're all about keeping track and accountability. And we're not about saying, you know what, I'm changing all the time. Like, marriages are fascinating because you, you, you marry someone and you're looking right at them, right? And you're looking at right the spot where they are and you know them and you know who you married and you got it all down. And every day that passes, they're changing and moving. And if you're still looking at that spot where they were, pretty soon you're going to lose sight of them altogether. Our whole process as human beings is to track each other's 
journey, right? And it yeah. can either be beautiful and full of surprises, or it can be a lot of goddamn work. It depends on your frame of mind. Yeah, it certainly does. So let's go into the idea of physical touch, because I'm really fascinated about this. And I'll tell you a quick story about my my closest personal male relationship, as maybe to set some context, because I think I'm a pretty open, pretty authentic, pretty vulnerable guy. But in some ways, this relationship is not typical, but it's I think you'll you'll see a lot of uh, commonalities with with other male relationships in it. So, you know, as far as what we talk about, we talk about all the things that are really important to us. Um, you know, I don't think there's any barriers there, but where there's definitely a barrier is around physical touch and also expressing how much the relationship means to us. We never say that to one another, right? It's, it's kind of implied and the energy when we're together certainly feels that way. But our, our, I, the idea of physical touch, I mean, it, it's shaking hands. Every time we see each other, we give each other a, a warm handshake, but the idea of anything more than that is certainly not on the table. And I, I'm not even sure that I would want to, but the other thing is, it's interesting is I have a very close, like we're the, my, myself and my wife and him and his wife are very close. So I'll text or send his wife a message afterwards and talk, you know, about what a great time we had and how much I valued their friendship, but I never say that to him. Right. Huh. And uh, so, yeah, so maybe we can just get into the idea of physical touch, because that's actually what, what led us to talking today, because I think it's really important. It's something that's missing in so many people's lives. Yep. Yep. Well, I, you know, I'm what I have found, uh, at least in my life, was having having a child taught me the power of uh, of physical touch, both as a source of comfort and connection. And and um, and prior to that, I. I mean, I, you know, I, I call myself a tong baby. Basically I was raised, uh, without being touched. Right. And, uh, and when I got my first girlfriend, it was all I could do to brush the, my knuckles against the back of her hand. And that, that was like, uh, that was like a, the equivalent of touching a, a you know, a molten lava, right. It was just impossible to do. I couldn't bring myself to do it. And I was, and the reason I couldn't bring myself to do it was, I was absolutely convinced that it would be rejected, right? Even though this person says, yeah, I'm your girlfriend. No, couldn't I? I mean, it was young. We were, you know, 14 or something, first girlfriend. But, but for me, for many years, I couldn't be physical with a girl without drinking. And mm. this is probably a pretty common story for people who grew up like I did. But it took a long time for me to ever get to the point where physical touch didn't have some kind of shaming element. And it's not that people were shaming me necessarily, but I had it in the back of my mind. And I always, and that always made me feel like it was transactional. I had to do some other stuff to earn the right to be in a romantic relationship, right? I had to, I had to do stuff to, I had to do stuff as a, as a husband in order to be allowed sexual touch. And the, and platonic touch wasn't even part of the picture anywhere, right? So we're talking about a very atrophied sense of what contact is. But when I had a kid, when I had this baby, I began to understand how calming it was for my child and for me to be in contact. And this is purely platonic touch on every possible level. And any parent, you know, who, who holds their own child understands the difference. And sometimes it's for the first time in their lives. Mm -hmm. So what that did is it taught me a lot about, you have to forgive me, my dog's in the back here, back no, that's okay. raising a ruckus. Um, it, the um, so the end result was that I eventually, um, you know, was left with uh, this observation that well, you know, it's not so bad this touching thing. I I I should be able to reach out and connect with people, and I wrote the article and I did a lot of other work around uh, the question of it. But what I ultimately found out was my hand reaches out and touches people. It just does. And I'm letting it do it. And I know there are a lot of issues. I don't tend to touch women. I don't know any of that. But but people that I'm, that there's some people, God, I see them on the street and my hand just goes and I just pat them on the arm. You know, hey, how are you? Now, for me, this is a big leap forward. For an evolved species, it's probably the Stone Age, right? Right. For, for my generation, for as far as I'm able to get in my lifetime, the idea that I view my contact with someone else as a positive uh, human gesture from from where I was as a kid, where I thought I it was it was just wrong 
because I was wrong, because I, I wasn't worthy of contact, um, that's a big step for me. You talk about generational change. Your father was beaten and he didn't beat you. I couldn't touch and now I can. Mm-hmm. And I'm hoping that I can share that with with my son and the next generation, that he'll be more comfortable with it. And, and all the signs I'm seeing is that he is, you know, because he was raised that way. He was held and loved and, and he now puts his arm around his, his guy friends at school and all of that. And God bless them. I hope they, I hope, I hope they keep it up. Yeah. So let's, you described an interaction you might have on the street with somebody where your arm goes out and touches them in your experience. How does that touch change that moment versus with, for both of you, I guess, if you hadn't rather versus if you hadn't done it? Well, my, my sense of it and believe me, you know, the article is all about the prohibitions against male touch, right? Um, don't do it in the office. Don't touch women. Don't do that. Everything's viewed as, um, as this sexualized, uh, potentially sexualized contact, right? Um, and people read it wrong, and it's a bad thing, and blah blah blah. But for me, that there there's a kind of touch where you reach and, and pat someone on the shoulder. There's a kind of touch where you uh, just make that brief contact. For me. It's, I, it's something about you. I really care about you right now. I really feel, it, you know, sense of connection is not the right word. I want to give you this. I want you to know I, I see something really human in you, and, and I am making, I'm t- You know, Peter Gabriel had that song, Touch. You remember that song? Mm-hmm. Uh, and and, uh, and he, he, he's singing about that, I believe, uh, that, that moment of contact, right? We, we are... There are so many people I see uh, that that seem like they could just use that, just a touch, just hey man, you know, hey, and that's all I got for it in the way of a of a larger explanation. I don't know how they're reading it. Some people I see look up like they're coming out of a dream, and they go, oh hey, you know, look at that, the monkeys touched each other. Wow, <laughs> yeah. You know? But there it is, you know. I mean, that's that's as much as I have for it. But it brings me great joy. And, and, uh, it, it lightens my day and I feel like it's a, it's not even a risky thing. I feel like it's just, Hey, you know, I see you there. Okay. So one of the last few questions I have is I think how it is, especially among men, how it can be typically perceived is the person that initiates the touching, uh, the contact is it's perceived as that being an act of dominance because you're, in, you're <laughs> yeah, invading, yeah. you're invading the personal space of the touch E, right? Yeah. So you're asserting dominance. Have you, I mean, do you, does that make sense to you or do you, have you seen that, I guess, or is that a common, uh, understanding of, of that, of that gesture based on where we are today as a society? You know, I, I think that, um, I think, I think there's weirdly creepy versions of touch, you know, and then there's there. And by that, I mean, like, people who do it for that reason that you're describing, you can read it in a second. It's really Mm -hmm. obvious, right? What's fascinating to me is we are, as human beings, all of us read the tiniest cues, the tiniest stuff. And when I, when I go up to somebody, you know, I often, you ever do the, the handshake half hug? Oh yeah. You go, you go in with the hand and you're like, Hey, this person's coming. I better go. Oh shit. I should have hugged them. Yeah. Pardon my French. I'm using a lot of bad words today. That's okay. Um, you come in with the half hug, and then you you're like, oh, I, I did that wrong. You know, this person's a hugger, and I I messed that up. Other times you come in with the hand, and you realize, okay, good. I'm just going to pat on the arm here. But you're reading micro cues. There's probably a thousand that go back and forth in that moment in in two seconds, right? Because the idea that we're not... I want to thank Mark for that amazing conversation. It's an honor to be able to talk to you and also to help you share your message to a different audience because it's so important. And that's one of the reasons I'm committed to doing this podcast is helping people with important things to say, get their message out to the world. And I want to end this podcast the way I end every single podcast. And that's by saying, if you have struggled, I want you to know that I have struggled too. And if you ever ever want to talk to me, I want you to know that I will not judge you. Until next time, my friends.